At a church convention, out comes the magician. And so, you know, we were kind of just laughing and having fun. And he did this, this, he had this lady write something on a piece of paper and he stuck it in a balloon and blew up the balloon. And then, before she popped it, he told her what was written on it. And I was astounded. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, how did he do that? How did he do that? So here's the thing about magicians. They always make me feel stupid, because I always feel duped by them. So I went home, Debbie and I went home, and we turned on our little, I had my uh, fire, or what is it, my Kindle fire, and I turned it on and I Googled, how does a magician, and I figured out the whole thing. It was a trick, right? As magicians always have. I couldn't believe it. I fell for it. And then I had to look it up and find out the information. It always seems to make me feel like I've been duped. The sermon series that Pastor Brian and I are preaching on through Advent and Christmas, we have called Believe. Believe. Because we want to talk about believing as being part of the mystery of Christmas and yet not magic, not a trick. We want to talk about what we really can believe in the story of Jesus coming into our world. So in the Gospel story that I read for us from the Gospel of Luke, we have Mary meeting an angel who tells her, who announces to her in a vision, that she is going to have a child, and that that vision comes in the city of Nazareth, right? And then if you keep reading on in Luke, you discover that Jesus, the child that's going to be born, will be compared to John the Baptizer. We had a little bit of that in our lesson today. And even as you continue to be somewhat like Isaac of the Old Testament, now, if you were to look at the same story in the Gospel of Matthew, we have um, not a vision, but a dream coming to Joseph, where he's told that Mary's going to have a child. And the dream happens in Bethlehem. I Go home and look this up, folks. In Bethlehem, and that Jesus will be compared to Moses and Isaac. What are we to believe? Now, most of the time in this season, we read from Luke instead of from Matthew. We kind of just want to not confuse the masses, right? But it's in our Bibles. Both versions of this story are there. And you know, sometimes we, like we often do at Lent as well, we just kind of merge all the stories and make it work so that we feel comfortable with this so that we know what we can believe. So today, I want to talk a little bit about what we can believe in this story, what's important in this story. And so, I first want to talk about births in the Old Testament, miraculous births that happen. For instance, the birth of Isaac and the stories of Samuel. If you'll remember, Sarah and Abraham wait a long time to finally have Isaac because they're old and barren. Not because she's a virgin or anything like that, but because she's old and barren. Now Hannah has the same problem. We don't know that Hannah is necessarily old, but we know that Hannah has prayed for a child for years. And finally, because her womb was closed, she goes to God and says, I will dedicate Samuel, the child I might have, to the church, to the temple, actually. And so we have in the Old Testament stories of barren and aged or of a closed womb, not of a virginal birth. So the story of Jesus' birth to Mary and Joseph is not a repetition 
of some old story of salvation from the Testaments that have come before. This is a new story. This is a new kind of birth. Well, then the other thing that we might want to look at is what was going on in the world when Jesus was born. What was going on in that time and place? They were under Roman occupation. The people were weighed down and heavy with burdens of taxes and with an occupying army that was present everywhere, with violence being on the streets daily. And the Roman Empire put forth the reasons for their being the ones in charge as being because Caesar was divine. The Son of God. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Brad talked about this as well. Caesar Augustus, however, didn't come from a virginal birth. He came from a divine birth of a human woman, they claimed, and one of the gods. Okay. So, yeah, Jesus' birth is not like that either. Jesus' birth was different because it was both divine and miraculous. There's a theologian by the name of Dominic Crossan, and he says, This story is about the theology of the child, not the biology of the mother. And so, as I've said once before, Jesus didn't die because he was born of a virgin. All right? That's the last time we hear this in the, in the Gospels. It's in this very beginning. On the cross where Jesus hangs at the end, it doesn't say he's being, being crucified because he was born of a virgin. It says he's crucified because he was the king of the Jews. Is it because he came to rule in a different way? To have a different message, a message of justice and peace, truly of peace, not Roman box, not the Roman peace that came because of violence. The child that was born would come into the world in a different way because he was greater than all history and than all present rulers. As God touched Mary and Joseph, their family changed because of the birth of a child in a most humble and yet profound way. The mystery begins. A theology of a child. Now conception in the ancient days was a mystery. Not like the days of now, where we know about fertilization and sonograms, and we can even truly tell, not predict, but tell the sex of a child before they're born. No, in the days of Jesus, even conception itself was a mystery, besides the idea of a child coming in a most miraculous way. For us, the story of the Annunciation, while yes, it is about Mary's openness and willingness to hear a wondrous story about what her child would bring to the world, and about Joseph's being willing to accompany them and be a part of this story of revolution, it is more about that child that would be born the child that she carried for nine months, and the child that she meets in Elizabeth with John the Baptizer. For us, we can believe that the Jesus that came into the world was and is still the greatest ruler of all time, who brought peace, who brought healing and justice, and who calls us as people of the way, as disciples and followers of Jesus, to open our hearts and minds like Mary, to hear a divine call, to carry the Christ child in our hearts into the world. May you know 
the child that changed the world, most especially in this season of Advent, that your Christmas may be about the theology of a child. This is no magic trick. This is how we do it. Amen.